uh, the university museum, how was, how was the you, if you can tell, tell us, uh, how was the funding done at the university museum? Uh, I, I don't fully know. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, I think the funding of the museum was largely done by um, uh, wealthy patrons, uh, people uh, whom uh, Rainey got to know. Rainey was a great social climber, and uh, he would get to know people to advance himself, and then he would ask them, how about giving us some money to the museum? And they often did. Uh, it was the, the personal approach. Um, I, I think he was, at first he was very successful in, in fundraising. Toward the end, he was not. Toward the end, the museum needed a roof and needed a lot of other things. Uh, incidentally, when I left the Chinese department, uh, he wanted to uh, to phase it out more or less, and so he told them to paint all the windows in the rotunda black. Um, when the windows were painted black, then the whole thing became a gloomy, dark place, and uh, you could watch visitors come in. They'd come to the door, and they sort of shudder at the grimness, and they'd walk away. Um, in time, the the paint washed off, and the Chinese rotunda is now a very popular place again. What about uh, the university museum within the uh, University of Pennsylvania? Do you feel that they had, they were considered part of the University of Pennsylvania, very, very much on the on the sideline? Uh, we in the museum are often upset that the students didn't come more often. Some students prided themselves on graduating without having in the museum. Uh, it, it was kind of. Um, a defiance. Why should we go to the museum, they would say. Uh, so I got to know many departments, and I'd invite them to visit me in the museum, and then I'd walk through a hall with them, point something out, and they'd come back. I worked very hard to get people to come to the museum. Another way I did it was uh, uh, they said we should have more of a turnover. We should have exhibits changing. So I invented an exhibit of the month, and one month it would be a, a Daggers of the world. Another month would be the use of walrus ivory throughout the world. Another time, the use of jade. Another time, it might be uh, uh, tobacco pipes. Another time, it might be uh, leather work. But always, there was a, a rather big case which told a story, uh, which um, was a thing that uh, the TV people would come and photograph it at the beginning of the month and would be in the papers. Um, to, attract attention to the museum. People would come to look at that, and then they'd wander on through other parts of the museum. And I tried to write the labels in such a way that uh, it would uh, tell about new discoveries and would also uh, perhaps inspire interest in other sections of the museum. Uh, it was very successful, but as soon as I left, that stopped. It's not, it no, not being it stopped as soon as I left. Uh, Rainey seemed to want to erase anything that I had done. What about now? Isn't it? No, nothing like that now. I think it should be revived because it was so successful. Do you feel, why, why was that feeling among the student of not wanting to go to university museum? Did you ever ask the student why they, were, they felt that way? Um, no interest? I really don't know why. I think that um, uh, perhaps as kids they had been taught that museums were dull places. <laughs> Uh, the museum's done a great deal to overcome that by having groups of school children come. And they've had a series of very good educators. Uh, the best one was um, Francis Iman, who unfortunately died of cancer a few years ago. Uh, Francis would bring the students in. She'd get out the Indian uh, war bonnets, and she'd uh, put the feathers on the children's heads, and she'd uh, show them how to make pots. And uh, they loved her. And many students would come back Many of the small students would come back to see Frances Simon because her personality was so winning. And it was a great loss when she died. Uh, she um, had had a lot of experience with the American Indians. She'd go out and visit the um, tribes people in New Mexico and Arizona, knew many of them as, as friends. And that's the kind of educator one needs. Someone, again, who's working from individual experience and less people handle things, and learn, learn to know the exhibitors, friends, as well. I understand that you travel extensively in 50, 60, even the 70 
to Europe doing research. What type of research were you doing? Um, when I was in the University Museum, I was constantly working on um, discoveries uh, through books, uh, the um, ancient Chinese books. And uh, I felt that was archaeology, too. In other areas, they considered that. But it wasn't giving the museum enough publicity. Rennie wanted the digs. Uh, but I was so much interested in the book, archaeology, that I, uh, when I left the museum, I kept on uh, going to the um, libraries and museums of Europe and Asia, uh, studying there. And uh, I would very often take a member of my family. I have five children, um, or else um, uh, some of the students. And um, I, I had a, a way of uh, showing them a country at the same time, getting time for myself at libraries down then. But the uh, whole idea was to broaden the thinking of young people so that they could go on and be teachers themselves. Uh, none of my student, I mean, none of my children have become teachers. Some of my students have, but, uh, but my children have always had that interest in other nations and the wider view that comes from actual traveling. Did, did any of your children come to Penn? No. Um, they, they liked Penn and knew it well and would come to the museum a great deal. But because my first marriage broke up just before there were times when we'd go to college, my wife decided to send them to other places. Uh, one did come to Penn uh, briefly, but he, he didn't finish. Uh, I think, too, that um, Penn had very high standards in the 1940s and 50s. And my children, although bright, were not, uh, not that bright. <laughs> That made one reason why they didn't come here. Um, when was the last time that you have been in China? Um, from 1938 to 1979, I couldn't. Oh, yes, I did. I was back in China during the war. But from 1945 to 1979, I couldn't get back to China. In 1979, I had a sabbatical. And uh, I got a phone call from the Lindblad Company, and they said, we want you to take a group to China this month. And I said, well, you only give me about 10 days, and uh, I don't have a passport, and I'm not terribly anxious to go. And they said, well, we'll get you the passport, and they did. And they'd give me 20 people, they gave me 40, and everybody got sick. And it was a, a nightmare, going back and seeing places I'd loved that had been burned to the ground or looted. And uh, uh, friends killed or exiled. It, it was a, a mess. I hated China. I'd been so fond of it before, but it, it just wasn't the China I knew. Um, but since then, I've been back five more times, uh, three times as a leader, um, twice as, as a passenger. And I, I've seen what the new China is trying to do, and it's succeeding rather well. It's, but I just can't judge it in old terms. It's a different. A different world. It isn't old China. Uh, the communists have exaggerated a lot about how bad old China was. It wasn't that bad. And uh, they've under-exaggerated the damage they did, the millions of people killed and so on. Uh, Mao is ruthless. But uh, nowadays, a, a new civilization is emerging, and it's a good one. Uh, I had to, to conquer my, uh, my nostalgia for the past and, and really think of it in terms of a totally different a new nation. And when I was able to do that, then I was a better leader. I, I haven't been since um, 1985. Uh, but one thing I can't forgive is the way the Tibetans are being treated. They're being destroyed. And they're wonderful people. Uh, I've known them so well over the years. And uh, they're being wiped out as a nation. Talk about genocide. It's just utter destruction. Um, 850 monasteries destroyed until they stones on the ground. Um, books that came from India in the 8th century burned because the Chinese couldn't read them. Um, and it's a barbarous thing and a cruel and terrible thing. Um, I've been so much impressed by the uh, 
kindness, the gentleness, the hospitality of the Chinese people in the past, and nowadays a kind of a ruthless speed, a, a kind of hectic, um, I suppose you find it everywhere. Uh, the element of greed is very strong. Uh, so strong that the last time I took a group, uh, we had uh, the company in New York had paid uh, to the Chinese government what was required for the uh, staying in various hotels. And uh, a man from the National Travel Agency in Canton said, uh, I'd like some more money, please. And the girl who was uh, in charge of the, um, the more or less the payment of direction the tourists said, uh, we paid everything in New York. Oh, no, you haven't. You've forgotten me. And uh, uh, so she said, what difference it makes? Well, he said, you want to go to so-and-so, but you won't be going there. And we went to another town. And they said, uh, did you pay extra to the company? And she said, no, I didn't. All right, uh, you can't stay at the good hotel. And they took us to a, a little country hotel way out in the sticks. And we found that uh, on our trip, it was constantly being sabotaged because she wasn't willing to pay bribes. This is 1985, and the situation is much worse now. Uh, the corruption is, is really sickening. Um, but uh, aside from the corruption, the hotels are so fine, the, um, the service is wonderful, if you've paid. And uh, uh, so many of the old buildings have been restored. Unfortunately, that isn't always good either, because they restore them somewhat garishly. And when they try to rebuild an old building, they've lost the principles. They were, uh, the principles of Chinese architecture were uh, very uh, intricate. Everything had be fitted just right. And uh, they made them of wood, so that when earthquakes came, uh, the building would perhaps uh, vibrate, but it, it would stand up. And now they build them of concrete walls. And uh, uh, just the... The old traditions are gone. You just what you're seeing now is, a, as I said, a new world, different. And uh, I prefer the past. And I still work with things of the past. Someone from the Oriental Story Department here is very close to China. It's Dr. Rickett. Did yes, you know Dr. Rickett? very well. Uh, Dr. Rickett's a fine person. I don't agree with his political views, but uh, as a person, he's, he's splendid. Uh, even he has changed. Uh, even he has, uh, he had very, very strong views pro Mao, and they've become much less. And uh, Dr. Bada was fanatic until he went to China, and he came back and he didn't speak to anyone for about six weeks. He just had this sad, sad face because it wasn't what he thought. Um, any revolution is destructive, but this one was superly destructive. Uh, Dr. Bader tried to see an old philosopher with whom he'd written a book, and he was forbidden to see him because the man was under house arrest for some reason. Um, Dr. Bader is one of the very great students of Chinese culture who's advanced the field very much. But he had a, a very deep feeling that Chinese communism was a necessary and important thing. And uh, when he found that the results were not as he imagined. It, it really was a terrible shock, which he hasn't entirely recovered from. And this was about six years ago. I think we're about to, how much we have? Dr. Rickett and Dr. Bode. There was something about some lectures done through, through, the, through television. Could you tell us about that, how that started? So, um, the, the year, um, let's see, must have been 1970, was it? 66. Oh, oh 1966, yes. Uh, that was a very, very difficult year for me because uh, uh, my children were scattered and I was worried about them. And uh, Dr. Bada said I must give an extra course. And uh, I, I found a topic of research that interested me very much. And with all these extra jobs, suddenly uh, someone said, we need to have a lecture on um, East Asia for the um, TV, WCAU. And uh, we want to have an early morning course. Will you do it? Well, it, it seemed 
uh, just one more thing to do. On the other hand, I felt I could use some of my notes from the Southeast Asia course. Uh, they wanted a, a discussion of Southeast Asia with emphasis on Vietnam to explain the Vietnam War. And I felt very strongly about the Vietnam War because uh, it was actually a civil war which we had no business to be involved in at all. And here were uh, so many young Americans losing their lives for what seemed to be a useless thing. Uh, one problem was that uh, the old dynastic name was Nguyen. Uh, there were, uh, the royal line were all Nguyen's. Uh, the American newspapers were not aware that this was a Nguyen battle because they used their first names as if you had a Wang Lin Chun and called him Lin Chun, which is very impolite in the first place. Well, um, uh, the Nguyen Kao Ki, um, they kept calling him Kao Ki, and he was a real villain who was operating behind the lines and was, uh, uh, the, I think, the Secretary of State for Air or something. And uh, he was getting enormous sums of money from the Americans. Uh, but he was a rogue. And uh, most of the Nguyens were rogues. But it was a, a battle between one set of Nguyens and Ho Chi Minh was only his communist name. He was a Nguyen too. It was a, a, an inter-family, inter-dynastic battle. And we had no business being uh, anywhere near it. And we ruined Vietnam. We ruined Cambodia even worse. Uh, we have a lot to a lot to atone for, and I thought that by talking about it over the TV, I'd make more people aware of it. As a result, probably I'm on the FBI's hit list. <laughs> but I've, it's so important to have truth, to have people know a situation, and not go blindly in, into a diplomatic international mess. When I think of the defoliation, when I think of the the destruction of whole villages, and the, especially in Cambodia, encouraging that horrible Pol Pot, encouraging by making such a mess there that it had to have a leader, and he was the wrong one. And uh, I just felt so strongly about it. Uh, some years ago, in New Hampshire, where we have our second house, um, a neighbor said uh, a Cambodian family has just come to town. Uh, they speak nothing that we can understand. And we're trying to get through them. We want to tell them how they can uh, live most favorably here. And we can't do anything about it. Will you come and try to do something? Uh, so I went and met a young man. And um, I said, in Chinese, we've come here to help you. And he looked at me blankly. His wife came in. And I said, is there anything we can do for you? She looked at me blankly. So I wrote it in Chinese. And they said, what? You know Chinese? And I said, yes. And they proceed to use the same dialect. <laughs> uh, they just, they thought that I was a foreigner, and so they hadn't even tried to listen. And uh, uh, then I went every day for a couple of weeks until we had to come back here. Uh, I'd draw pictures and write the Chinese names of things. And uh, he was a very well-educated fellow. He'd been brought up to know Chinese as well as Cambodian. And uh, I remember the triumph the last day when I took him to the general store, and he was able to read the labels on cans and things like that. He said, you've changed our life. Uh, unfortunately, I went back next spring, and I asked where Mr. Ngo was. And they said, oh, didn't you hear? He died. Um, and I, I know why. Uh, he never woke up one night. He had a massive heart attack. But I think I know why. Because one day, he was looking very sad. And it would have been impolite to ask him why. Um, so I just waited until he told me. He said that 56 members of his family were killed his parents, his favorite aunt, his beloved cousins. And uh, uh, he said, I can't talk with this. I can't talk about it to my wife, because she lost even more. And uh, it was that bottle up inside him, this resentment, this uh, hatred, uh, and this, um, uh, this terrible homesickness. And that must have been what finally killed him. Talking about that resentment, um, there was a, a lot of um, student unrest during the 60s. Um, oh, great, so, yes about the Vietnam War. Um, and many, many students in the Vietnam War were uh, terribly upset. In fact, some came to study with us because they didn't want to, to go to war. Uh, they felt that the war was unjust, but they didn't know why. And uh, I felt it was necessary to, at least in my Southeast Asia course, I didn't 
uh, I didn't inflict myself on them as a propagandist, but in the Southeast Asia course, I tried to explain how things were, the historical events that brought about the war and how we had no business being in it. Uh, the students at that time were so disillusioned about the war, I think that's what made them so excitable, what induced them to, to riot and even make trouble in the president's office here. Uh, there was a, a sense that the world wasn't right, that things, they were being told one thing by the government and, and uh, they were being forced into a war that they had no sympathy for. It, it was a bad situation. How the university dealt with it? Uh, the university was very calm. They, um, I think it was, uh, wasn't it President Myerson at that point? Um, it was Harnwell at first, but I think Myerson at the end when they yeah. found out by the office. Um, we all liked President Harnwell. Um, he was a very fine man. Um, one day I was giving a lecture, I think it was on Southeast Asia, and uh, a, a very tall, rather huge man came and sat at the back very quietly. And uh, just before the end, he walked out. And uh, I re realized he was President Harnwell. Uh, but he, he did that. He would. Uh, he wanted to make sure that students are being taught uh, conscientiously and properly, and he didn't ask permission to come, he just quietly came. And uh, uh, he, he had a deep interest in, in the teachers and how the university worked, and I, I think he was perhaps the most concerned, most involved president that we've had that I can remember. Uh, perhaps the worst was Stassen, who um, had political aims, and he came with the political intention. He was a kindly person, but he was uh, out stumping and lecturing politically, and, and he didn't have much time for the university. But Hornwell stands out as being a very superior human being. Uh, I think he, having been a teacher himself, he had a, a special sympathy for, for education. And uh, at the same time, uh, he was a, a, a man who inspired confidence by his, uh, just his, his kind and gentlemanly way of doing things. Really fine person. Were you here during, yes, you were, during the, the McCarthy time, the McCarthy era that you had a lot um, No, I think I was, I was finishing my, oh yes, I was. Uh, yes, I, I was. I had been studying with um, Owen Lattimore in um, Baltimore, because Owen Lattimore was a great authority on the Mongols and Tibetans. and. Um, uh, then when McCarthy called him up, I protested in the papers about it because um, McCarthy uh, called um, Lattimore a communist. He wasn't. Uh, Lattimore was deeply interested in all phases of politics, uh, but he's also interested in human beings, and he used to um, sometimes play with human beings. If he were uh, with a conservative, as I was at that point, uh, he would... Uh, uh, talk the party line just to, to see my reaction. But he was with communists, he'd tell them that he thought they were fools, that they were um, uh, idiots, they were going about things the wrong way. He, he just enjoyed needling people. And he needled uh, one of his um, colleagues, for the moment I can't remember the colleague's name, who's in the geography department. And um, uh, that man uh, told McCarthy that um, Ladd was a communist. As a result, the Ladmores had to sell their little summer place in New England. They, had, they went into debt. They, um, they were hounded. They had a terrible time. And um, shortly after that, Mrs. Ladmore died, and, and uh, he was left in despair. He finally went over to England to teach because he just couldn't stand here anymore. And uh, I felt terribly sorry for him. And as I said, I, I wrote in his behalf in the inquiry, and, and I think I even spoke in the radio for him, but uh, it didn't work. And he, he left a bitter, bitter disillusioned man. And the, the country lost a great educator. Do you know of any other faculty member at Penn that was affected by that? Uh, Dick Barter was called up before McCarthy. Um, I, I don't know whether there were others, too. But I remember that Dirk felt it very badly, uh, felt persecution, which it was. 
I, I think the whole McCarthy time was, a, it was kind of a disease. A, 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 Split the nation badly, and it took years for it to wear off. Uh, he was such an unprincipled scoundrel. McCarthy was. Stasson, or during the Stasson time, uh, why, why he was regarded of not being the ideal president here at? Do you know of, of um, that, of his... I think Stassin was a, a fine, well-meaning man, but his ambition for politics was so great, he was so determined to be president of the nation that uh, he didn't give full time to the university. We felt that he was uh, not exactly aloof, but he just wasn't spending as much time here as he should. And I think he finally felt that he didn't belong here. And about that time, they were looking for a new president, and Rainey was determined that he'd be president. And uh, uh, when he wasn't made president, that's what made him so very bitter and so nasty to everybody. Uh, he, he was doing all kinds of uh, lectioneering behind the scenes, but it didn't work. Was he able to get a, another position? Uh, um, he married a wealthy French countess and just dropped out of stepped out of the whole museum world and everything. By the way, do you know Dr. Isley? I, I knew Lauren Isley very well. Uh, when he first came, uh, he was a very heavy fellow, rather coarse looking, and uh, uh, very nasty. Uh, he would try to start a conversation and he'd cut it off. Uh, then as time went on, he, he got very thin, uh, very benign, very friendly, and a wonderful fellow. I, I came to, to feel that there was someone, a person of, of great stature as a human being. Um, but I've, I've had a very hard time trying to understand why he was so awful at first. I think he was, a, by nature, kind of a loner, a shy man. And uh, I think he tried to cut off people who wanted to be friendly because he just didn't know quite how to act. But uh, in time, I remember once I, I was at the um, university post office, and he walked in, and I said, uh, Lauren, I just read your last book, and I think it's inspired. It, it's so smooth. It must be very easy for you to write. Easy, hell. I rewrite everything 12 times. <laughs> but it, it's because he was so, um, so patient in correcting and editing. And in those days, without word processes, it wasn't easy. You had to just tear up pages and throw them away and begin all over again. But um, his patience and his fondness of poetry, I think, is one answer. He, his choice of words was so good. It really, he's an inspired writer. And now, in picking up his books, I can almost hear him saying the things. Uh, did you know him by any chance? No, very unfortunately, I miss him, but I have heard of him a lot. Uh, there is another faculty member who is very well liked uh, by the, uh, because it's very unique to um, Dr. D.B. Balsell. By any chance do you have any rapport with him? Um, I never had any direct connection as a, uh, in the department with D.B. Balsell, but I've always liked him. Uh, he's deservedly popular. Uh, he had a really profound knowledge of sociology and economics and such, and an ability to uh, do good, solid research and to write well about it. But just as a human being, he, he's so nice. And uh, uh, he had a wonderful way with students, very understanding. Uh, many students looked upon him as a parent, as some students felt to me, too. Uh, but I, I, I really felt that Penn was lucky in having people such as Isley and Balzell. Wonderful people. Beautiful. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, would you like to, if, if I ask you, uh, what would be your fondest memory at the University of Pennsylvania, at the mm -hmm. University of Pennsylvania, what that would it be? Your fondest memories here. Yes. Um, when I first came to Penn, the trolleys were running through the middle of the campus. 
in the summer, they didn't have any side walls. But people sort of uh, hung on the outside, especially in, in football games. Be, people were hanging all over the trolleys. And uh, uh, the changes have been so great in the course of time, and as the great buildings, the Rodbys and so on arose. But one of my fondest memories was um, I, I used to give a course in, let me begin from, from the beginning. Um, uh, Lewis Mumford was here uh, as one of the world's great architectural historians. And he decided it would be important to give a course in the uh, origins of religious architecture, that is, the religions and philosophy that inspired the building of the great cathedrals and the great mosques and temples. Uh, so uh, we arranged that he give the course in the autumn about uh, the Near East and Europe. And I'd give it in the spring about uh, the religions of Asia. And uh, we did it for one year, a year and a half, with great success. And then he was called to Brandeis. So I gave the whole thing alone for several years. And uh, uh, it began at 7 in the evening, 7 to 9. And when it finished, we'd go over to the Juan and Hada Cafe, and we'd talk to midnight. And uh, I got to know the student so well, and we had such profound conversations. They might begin with religion and end with politics or something, but um, I got to know the student so well, and I felt that I was getting through to them in a way I couldn't in ordinary lectures. It was a very wonderful period. And one night I was lecturing to them, and I looked out the window, and there was a huge explosion that shook the building and a great mush out of light. And uh, it was the great grain elevator opposite what is now the, what was the bulletin building. And it exploded, and it went up. Uh, a huge a column of flame and then billowing out. And I thought it might be an atom bomb, and so uh, I just kept on quietly lecturing. I, I, I was the only one who actually saw the explosion because I was facing the window and the students weren't. Um, and after about an hour when things seemed to be calmer, I said, explosion, let's go and look at it. And we went out and there was a, a, several streets where there'd been, I think they call it implosion, um, where uh, the vacuum had been so great, it had drawn the, the windows out and smashed them in the street instead of breaking them in. So the streets were full of broken glass. And uh, it looked like a war area. And where there had been this uh, multi-towered grain elevator, there was just an immense hole in the ground. And uh, it pushed the bulletin building some inches off its base. It um, uh, did some drastic things to the, the big um, station, there's the street station. And then all the buildings around it were shattered. Uh, it was a, a, a memory of just complete destruction. I had seen terrible destruction in the war, uh, but uh, this looked like a war scene. It, it took several months for Philadelphia to recover and for things to be gradually uh, restored. Uh, there were three or four people who were working in the grain elevator. and. One man had hobnailed shoes. He was told he mustn't do it, but he did. And apparently scraping his foot, uh, it caused sparks. And there's always a certain amount of, of gas in a uh, fermenting grain, so that um, it just, uh, the, the, uh, the vastness of the explosion was just appalling. It, it left a, a deep impression for a long time. One thing, uh, you said that you met with a student in Hor and harder. Why not Houston Hall? That was something that's... The uh, Houston Hall was closed at night then. And, and um, I think Houston Hall closed after supper. But uh, Horn and Harder was open all night, practically. And uh, it was a, at that time of night, it was rather quiet. And, and it was a nice opportunity just to talk freely. And the students felt relaxed over a cup of coffee. So that was your meeting place? Yes. <laughs> Could you tell me about Dr. Monk, Professor Monkford? How was, what type of a man was he? Um, Lewis Monkford was an extraordinary man. He, he was um, a very benign. He looked like somebody's grandfather. Uh, but he was a man of, of deep convictions. And uh, uh, he would express himself very freely. And what he thought were things about the modern world that were um, uh, things going in the wrong direction. In fact, he wrote a very wonderful book that showed human progress and uh, showed two ways ahead. 
one way of complete destruction, the other way of a new world. And uh, he personally felt that he felt very depressed and, and sometimes um, pessimistic, but he had an inner confidence that human beings went out. And uh, I, I really got so much from talking with him, and the, the students loved him. Uh, he had a, a way of, uh, he'd be telling stories and sort of inculcating ideals. Uh, he was a man of strong ideals, and he uh, passed them on. And very sadly, uh, New York Times a few weeks ago said, uh, uh, now in his 90s, his mind is totally gone. Um, it's, um, he has Alzheimer's in a very extreme form, and um, his wife has to kind of cover for him. Um, she was a splendid person, too. She had no part in the active in the university, but she was a gracious hostess in inviting students into tea. We all liked her. There was another man who was very unique, too, um, sometimes not fully understood. Louis Kahn. Did you have any rapport with Louis Kahn? No. I don't, mm -hmm. don't remember yeah. the name. Yeah. Architecture. Very good name, architecture. Now, this talking about your teaching, what about your, your fondest memory at the, the University Museum? Some um, at the University Museum, I, I deliberately would, if I had to cross the building for any reason, I'd deliberately go a different way each time through other rooms to get to know the whole museum. And uh, I felt it was, um, it was the university in itself. I was learning so much all the time about other people and places. And I so much enjoyed, uh, after my class in Chinese or Japanese subjects, I would take students to the Mesopotamian room or others and uh, uh, try to introduce them to the world in greater depth. Uh, but the museum is a wonderful place. And um, it, it meant so much to me that um, uh, when I was forced to leave, it was as though something had died. And then shortly after, with my family breaking up, uh, it, it, there were some terrible years. But I'm very happily remarried and uh, to somebody else. <laughs> and, uh, my children, although it's ter been a terrible shock them, they've survived. And I have six grandchildren. Uh, the present life, I, I still do a lot of research in, in Chinese studies. And, uh, and now with the word process, it's so much easier. <laughs> what a difference it makes. There was somebody else who loved the University Museum, they, they loved the field. Uh, perhaps you met him, Dr. Daly? Lloyd Daly. Oh, we all like Lloyd Daly. Uh, he was, um, I think I first met him in Athens. I was staying at the American School in Athens, and uh, um, he was such a warm-hearted, friendly, delightful person. And although his interest in Greece was so very deep, he had interest in the rest of the world, too. Uh, I must say that uh, one thing that I think I enjoyed more than almost anything else was the Department of Oriental Studies seminars. It met on Tuesdays for uh, two hours from about um, 9 to 12. And the professors would sit in the big table, and the students would sit around the edge. And uh, there'd be topics like um, um, kingship, or um, marriage, or um, uh, some aspect of religion. And um, I, I was so deeply inspired by them that quite a number of my articles came from that. And, uh, it caused some resentment among my immediate colleagues because I began to write on th uh, subjects of, about India and the Near East and other areas where they thought I should stick to my immediate field. But I, I never felt I had an immediate field. I always felt the world was my oyster, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's so much uh, to um, write about in the way of, of cross-cultural influences. China gave so much to the world. It, um, there was a recent book by a man named Temple called The Genius of China. And uh, even more than Mr. Needham's book, it, it shows the tremendous achievements of uh, uh, great world discoveries that, that changed civilization that came from China and are not, not yet fully recognized. And uh, I felt that it was part of my obligation to, uh, to tell some of this, uh, how uh, in world in the world when transportation was so 
inadequate, to say the least. Uh, people did get around an extraordinary degree. And the, uh, the, the, the just single individuals, like Will Adams, who was an Englishman on a Dutch ship and was wrecked off the Japanese coast, uh, he was a one-man cultural revolution. Uh, he uh, taught the Japanese so much about uh, Western engineering. It, it doesn't take a whole invasion, but just individuals. And I, I'm, I was very much interested in certain people like Zhang Chen, who was a, a, a captive of the Huns and who got to Central Asia and brought back Central Asian ideas to China. But the cross-fertilization ideas is extraordinary and exciting field. That's why they say that there were a cultural interconnection between the East and the West? Much more so than people realize. Uh, very much more so. In fact, um, one of the Roman emperors sent a group of jugglers to China, and uh, the Romans came and juggled and then went home. <laughs> but uh, there was uh, quite an extensive trade uh, between China and Rome in silk. And the silk was so fine that it was somewhat transparent. And so uh, the Romans made laws saying uh, that it was lewd to wear fine silk, and they even made uh, laws against using it. But in the um, port of Rome, in Ostia, they were dredging one time and they brought up some Chinese bronzes. Uh, there was a really extensive trade between Chinese and Rome. And the one time that Chinese met a, a small Roman army, they beat the Roman army. And uh, uh, there's an awful lot of that sort of thing. Uh, I was in Ceylon for the University Museum. Um, I was met by an archaeologist and a uh, uh, he was uh, very dark. And uh, every time I tried to start some conversation, he would cut me short. And we were passing through a, a village where there was a fair. And uh, uh, women in these beautiful gowns, bright colors. And I said, what beautiful colors? He said, color? Do you say color? I said, yes, look at those beautiful saris. And he said, you don't like my color, do you? And I said, it, it makes no difference to me. He said, you wouldn't eat with me, would you? Of course I would. So as we had lunch, he began to be very friendly. And uh, he said, there's something I'm going to show you. Uh, so we uh, walked out down a little country lane. And we came to a kind of a cape that jutted out into the sea. And he said, around this cape, the Roman galley sailed. And uh, I smiled. And he said, don't you laugh at me. Come. And he took me to the local library. And he said, bring out the baskets. Uh, and uh, they brought out two bushel baskets full to the top with Roman coins that had been found on the beach. Uh, as the Romans uh, got out of their ships, their things fell out of their pockets. And uh, uh, there were coins from the time of Nero uh, to about um, 300 AD. And uh, I, I don't know coins well, but uh, I, I could recognize they were all Roman. And uh, he said, you know, it was a very extensive trade with Rome. And later that was written up by um, a fellow who was on TV with us, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, uh, called Rome Beyond the Imperial Frontiers. Fascinating book. And uh, it's, it's taken all the, it's nearly, must be nearly 40 years since uh, uh, Wheeler wrote the book, and it isn't yet in our history books. And uh, that's what um, is discouraging in the academic field. You make a discovery, it takes years and years for it to filter down, unless Time or Newsweek has to pick it up. And it's a, a slow business, and partly because so many of the articles are written in this uh, scientific jargon. And it's really necessary. Um, I found it a liability sometimes. A couple of my articles have been rejected because they, were, they felt too popular. That's important. You have to, communication is, is the aim. You have to communicate ideas. But some people who do the scientific journals are very snobbish and they want things to sound deep, whether they are or not. But by the same token, someone can write utter trash and write it in jargon, and it gets published. There isn't always justice in the publishing field. I understand that you're doing some writing. You still are you doing some. Uh, yes, I'm deciphering some of the ancient Chinese symbols. In fact, um, symbol studies have been one of my chief interests because it's almost a language, uh, especially in China, there's such a richness of uh, pictures which uh, look like pictures, but they all have meaning, very often deep meanings. Uh, recently, someone wrote a book on Chinese rugs and said, uh, 
no use talking about the symbols. They would, they just, just mean luck. Uh, that's nonsense. Uh, luck is involved sometimes, but uh, birth, death, marriage, uh, uh, wealth, education, all these things come into the symbol language. And I found some very ancient symbols which have always been thought to be abstractions. They're the ones made of uh, three whole or broken lines, and then you put two of them together, making six lines. It's the basis of the I Ching. Uh, and uh, I found there was a great deal of uh, symbolism in those simple lines, and it's uh, beginning to reveal a great deal of the mind of ancient China, which has not been known before. It's fun. It has uh, all the excitement of a detective <laughs> chase, and uh, it has its uh, blind alleys, its false leads, and then when something clicks, it's so exciting. Are you taking visuals of that, right? You're making slides with it, by um, any chance? So I, I think I have, I have some slides, but yes. But, uh, but the, no, but the, the, it's just the, um, uh, just the thrill of <laughs> discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it keeps me active and alive. At 77, I feel very much younger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're going to, I think, uh, what else would you like to, to, to make a statement? I really would like to talk. You mentioned Dr. Dyson. Yes. Why, why do you consider him so special, so unique? You, I mean, you, you touched on that before. but uh, I, I think Dyson is rather unique because uh, here's a fellow who um, has been a, a digger uh, in the field, who's made some real discoveries in um, Iran. And then uh, because of political situation, was forced to give up that field he liked so much. And he was very capable dean here. Uh, I had some dealings with him as a dean. He was uh, very um, honest and forthright. He could see both sides of a situation. And uh, now as head of a museum, having always been so fond of the museum, uh, he's been able to get a loyalty and a sense of cohesion, a sense of reviving the family spirit that the museum used to have. I, I really think he's a very superior fellow, and, and we're the museum lucky to have him. Do you still? Do you still go, I mean, you still keep close contact with the museum now? Right? Oh, yes. I, um, I use the library a lot. Uh, it's one of the best run libraries that I, I know. Um, Jean Edelman is a superb librarian and um, a, a very human friendly person. Uh, there was a horrible librarian before, for years, a Miss Griffin. Um, the dictionary of Griffin is a composite monster, and she was a composite monster. <laughs> Uh, if a student forgot to return a book, she'd blame me for it. And uh, uh, she'd, um, you know, in, in China, you can't make someone lose face. You can't scold them in public, but she would. And uh, I'd walk in the library, hey, you, uh, your student, Bill Jenkins, hasn't returned that book. It's up to you to get it back to me. And because uh, uh, everyone would jump up from their books and stare at me as if I were a culprit. <laughs> and, uh, she just enjoyed. Uh, putting people off base and knocking them by and uh, nasty, scandalous remarks mm -hmm. at regular gossip center. But when she left, um, uh, Jean Edelman was exactly the opposite and couldn't be anyone nicer. Mm -hmm. I think she'd be a good interviewer. Did you get uh, f together with the old timers from the University uh, Museum? You get uh, on, um, uh, once a month, there's a, a, a faculty meeting uh, at the museum, a kind of a lunch, and uh, some are museum people and, and the uh, rest of the Department of Oriental Studies. And uh, that's particularly interesting because not only do we reminisce about old times, but uh, we learn about new discoveries and what's going on in the, in the greater field. Uh, one thing about Penn, there's always been that sense of uh, interest in what other museums, uh, other universities are doing, so that it's it's not a provincial thing. It has wide, um, wide tentacles out into other areas. So they keep very much abreast mm -hmm. of what other museums yes. are Yes. Yes. Uh, Quite a different from Harvard and Princeton. They're very narrow and insular and uh, uh, very much contained. Uh, Penn, Penn has had a, a freedom which is healthy, a broad view. There is someone who is very also who's very supportive of the uh, University Museum, that's two people. Um, 
Mr. Treasure and uh, Robert Treasure? No, I, I, I've met him, yes. I don't know him very well. What about um, Mr. Harry Chance? No, I don't know Harry Chance. No. Okay, I think this uh, we cover a lot. Okay, <laughs> yes. Unless you have anything else that I might have, we might have not covered. That you I, I can't think of anything. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. But I think that is fabulous. Thank you very much.